the plan of starting Kai was never with we'll build a brand. I don't think we ever imagined that we'll have a retail store. You just can't get things. You have to learn how to value things. Okay, but what are the learnings that you took from the family business that you now apply to Kai? There was no Indian brand doing Western eye shoes. This all sounds very easy, but ऐसा रहा नहीं होगा. So, what were the initial challenges and struggles? जो या फिर initially थे और अभी कुछ change हुए हैं तो किस type के struggles हैं या challenges हैं? I think you learn a lot from your mistakes. So, I remember clearly the first few designs we had Kali Gar Singh. Mia भी भी पागल हो गए. कुछ भी बना रहे. कौन खरीदेगा? So, you don't come from the business background. So, how did your family react to it? If it's shoes, make sure there's no leather because I come from a Jain family and he's a vegetarian. There are so many pages. Brands are trying to be creators. Creators are trying to be brands. There's so many things. How do you break the clutter and you know engage with the communities? You have to do what you do best. Don't try and compete with other people because you'll go crazy doing that. Today we have someone who are helping women put their best foot forward. This is Abhishek Samathur, founder and editor of Local Samosa. Join me in welcoming the co-founders of the Kai Store, Aradhna and Dhanraj Minawala, to this Local Premier podcast. Hello, Aradhna, and hi, Dhanraj. Thank you for joining us here. Hi, thank you for having us. Hello, thank you. <laughs> So you guys are settled now. Yes, no, <laughs> very well settled. So you both come from different backgrounds. So how was the journey like, and how were the foundation years for that? So I've grown up in a very sheltered family, a protected. It's me and my sister. My dad's a banker. My mom's a housewife. So my dad, growing up, was always discipline, structure. Everything should be on time. Um, even if I wanted something small, being the elder one, it was. Um, You just can't get things. You have to learn how to value things because you get a penny per in the bank. You know, I never understood that back then, but I understand that completely now, and I thank him every day for teaching me that. Um, I remember I wanted a I wanted a laptop when I was in school or college, and he's like, "Okay, I want a presentation. Why you need a laptop? You know." So it came from that <laughs> background. I knew he was going to give it to me, but he wants me to know why and what value will that give me. and back then i'm like that's so mean you know my sister got things very easily with just a small tear drop <laughs> so but i appreciate and value why he does that cuz i do that to my kid now um so growing up yeah in a very uh, you know sheltered protected family um i did my schooling from bombay i grown up born brought up from in bombay did my bms uh, bachelor management studies from jehan college and then i went on to warwick to do my masters in marketing and strategy um and then came back to india uh, joined sr at, in the corporate branding team i worked there for two and a half years and then i moved to smash and i worked in the marketing team for them when they just started out mm -hmm. um that's when i met dhanraj and uh, when i got married to him i decided i wanted to do my own thing i didn't want to work for anybody So initially, I started working with the family business, but my father not taught me how to, you know, see emeralds and you know diamonds. And we both started a small, small startup within the company in uh, the jewelry business, where we were like wedding jewelry planners for okay. you know upcoming brides and families. So, but I just realized that that wasn't my passion. That's not something I was really enjoying doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think our common passion was footwear. Uh, where i think we loved we we shared the love for uh, for shoes and always fought for the larger shoe closet when i got married he got the largest shoe closet or he got the shoe closet and i got the rest but um i think that's where it started off our passion for it and we said let's just do something of our own you know as a small holiday fund and that's when kai started i think so So my name is Dhanraj Meenawala, and I'm the co-founder at the Kai Store. Um, I come from a completely pure Gujarati family, very close-knit. Uh, four generations all have been jewelers, and uh, pretty much as a child, it was kind of embedded that you're going to grow up and be a jeweler because that industry was not like a typical uh, educative industry where you know you had to study to get a degree. Yeah. Uh, it typically was the business that generations followed so growing up i did my schooling from bombay scottish i was not the best student but uh, 
was always a jovial guy and played a lot of sports for my school. Oh, post that, did my college BMS from Jain, and I went on to work at Percept. Oh, marketing, advertising was something that always oh, intrigued me. So I joined the BTL team at P9, where we used to sell, you know, activations in malls and cinema spaces, etc. Did that for a year, year and a half, and I realized that I think I should start, uh, you know, with what my core is or what I want to do, which is jewelry. So I went off to London, studied gemology. I uh, did a nine-month course. It was the first time that I ever stood first in a class or in an exam. Mm -hmm. uh, was in gemology, and uh, yeah, I think came back, joined the business. It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed. I enjoyed thoroughly. Enjoyed those seven years of you know full-time working at Lion Jewelers, and uh, we started a new vertical. We started doing shows and pop-ups around the country. We made a new line. Uh, you know, of ready-to-wear jewelry that could be sold through social media, okay. because those were the years back in 2014, 15 when Instagram was new, bloggers were coming up. Uh, we were aware of that space because of my sister, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who was blogging at the same time. And yeah, I think uh, eventually, once we got married, we realized that uh, there was this thing that we wanted a small business where we could kind of get make some more money. And the plan of starting Kai was never with, we'll build a brand. Mm -hmm. I don't think we ever imagined that we'll have a retail store or we'll build a brand or people will know about the brand. Mm -hmm. It was just that, can we make some shoes and sell them to make some money? Wrong objective. But <laughs> honestly, that was the objective back then. And I think a year, a year and a half, we did that. There was no employee, no team. Uh, we would give it two hours or three hours a day and things would kind of move forward. And while she was pregnant with Arden, I think uh, was the time when I decided to help out a lot more with Kai. And we decided to take part in an exhibition called A Little Flea. And that show, I think, changed the way we looked at ourselves. Mm. Post that show, I think the first night, clearly, remember, she was eight months pregnant or nine months pregnant. Eight months. And uh, she was at the show selling. And people were shocked, saying, okay, you're still standing in the heat, it's hot. Uh, BKC in the open in the afternoon and we realized that the amount of people who came to the store or the, our stall knowing that hey I've bought from Kai I've heard of Kai we want to see what new stuff you have and that kick or that excitement that we got I think was clear that this is not mm. something that you know we were looking at just to make a quick buck this is something that has potential to be a brand and what we're doing we're doing something right that people are liking I think that was the turning point in our career where we decided that let's go in full-fledged to now see what we can do with this. And I think we've done all our exhibitions. I mean, not all. In the first two, three first years. four years maybe. Both of us standing there For and morning selling. Dinner. And it was such a nice feeling because you get to meet everyone who is buying your shoe, who loves your brand. Yeah, and the kind of feedback, feedback you yeah. get, oh. the kind of conversations you have, they remember you. It's, I think, uh, There was a time when we knew 70% yeah. of our customers knew us directly. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. we had sold almost everyone's first pair to them. And they could reach out to us if they had an issue. Yeah. If we had a query about a design, we would straight away reach out to them. So I think if we can build that today with scale, I think that's the secret sauce that would help a startup yeah. succeed. Well, what's in the name Kai? Why did you guys come up with it? So, so I think when we started off, we had... Uh, as I said, the intention wasn't a large brand. We, we were clear we wanted a short name uh, and something where we would be, we, our goal was to sell only flats because comfort and fashion was key and never to get into heels at that point of time. So the logic was if I sell you comfortable flats, you wear flats because you're happy, because you're casual, you're happy, you're not dressing up, you're not mm. being uptight. So uh, when we got the name Kai, we came across and it meant happy and rejoice in Welsh. Okay. It meant colorful in Chinese. So I think all of those words made sense to us. And also, we got trademark, we got patent, we got <laughs> .com available, we got everything with it. So, so. Nice story. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't that much important given the name back then because the purpose was to start a business, hmm. not a brand back then. Okay. So did you guys meet during like your college or? Oh you? yes, we were in the same college. We have a lot of common friends, okay. same college, but I don't think that's we where not, we met. Yeah, we were not <laughs> friends <laughs> during college. Uh, she was a year senior to me. 
okay. the same yeah. course. Okay. Oh, uh, but we eventually met through common friends post college. A couple oh. of years later, we ended up meeting at a party, and I think that's when it just hit off. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's yeah. interesting. <laughs> okay, how was your childhood like? Uh, what were your other than your you know business and other than your studies and college? What were your childhood like, and how were you growing as a person? What were your interests? So mine was pretty much sports uh, most of the day. Hmm. Entire schooling would be school, and then would be either basketball or football, or again going down and playing. And hmm. pretty much that was on repeat for ten years. Uh, I was not very inclined towards uh, studying, or wasn't a topper at school, hmm. but always pretty much part of every sports team that the school had. Oh. I that? definitely didn't share a passion for sports, <laughs> but I was a. So I have a you yeah, have a younger sister as well, and a lot of discipline and structure, and you know, mm -hmm. um, studying is everything, and getting good marks is everything. But though I was an average student, I think I just was a very friendly person, um, and yeah, I mean, I I've I've had a great childhood. I wouldn't say anything about that. The um, same, but I think mine was completely it, opposite. Yeah, I mean, there was no pressure to stand first in school. Yeah, or always be a better human being. Uh, be a nice person. Yeah. It's okay. You know, if it interests you, study hard. If it doesn't, it's okay. Do what you got to do. But it was never that you have to come first in your class or be a topper. And how young were you when you started going to your factory and this? Uh, so I think with college, post school, uh, there was college, and you know how junior college in Bombay is. Yeah. Uh, I think my parents were pretty open about it with me, and they knew that there were very few hours that I was actually attending <laughs> college during junior college. So. I would do three hours every day of office in the morning, okay, and then head to college by eleven thirty twelve. No, so it was basically me going and doing something constructive, right? Idly for those two years. Yeah, no, that's a great learning on job. Like be it family business or be it somewhere else, learning on job definitely yeah. has its own pros. Completely, and I stuff. mean you learn everything from scratch. Right. You feel whatever you may have learned in university and schools and yeah. everything, what you learn on the job is. The biggest education you'll get out there. Yeah, that gets outdated. The courses yeah, get outdated. Completely. But the experiences that you get on job actually. Yeah, and even with Kai today, I think a lot of learnings or a lot of you know in decisions we've made are based on a lot of learnings from mm -hmm. our careers in the past right. and our mistakes in the past. Yeah. So I think all of that definitely has a major role mm -hmm. in today where Kai is or where we are. And I think if I'd done my masters before, after starting Kai, I would have been able to apply a lot more. Mm -hmm. But then, would I have I ever gone back to studying? So that was always yeah. the question. Okay. Uh, you come from family business background, so tell me what are the pros and cons of coming from a family business? So, in a family business, I think. The mainly pros, and mainly I mean, there's already a base set, right? Hmm. You know the ideal ten errors that one would make are already made. Yeah, you've already learned from the mistakes. You have set vendors, set processes, so hmm. it becomes a lot easier. Uh, the con is, uh, it's sometimes difficult to change mindsets. Hmm. It's difficult to change circumstances. It's difficult to um, create that change when things have been moving in a particular way or a pace for a long time. Mm -hmm. So to create that change, I think. Uh, is difficult to get that individual individuality to actually achieve something will not happen at ease in a family business. Right. Decision makers are multiple. Mm -hmm. If you're new in the business, it's uh, kind of difficult to be overturn a senior's decision in the family. Mm -hmm. I think those factors do. Even if you're right or wrong, mm -hmm. if your grandfather's in the business, your dad's in the business, your uncle's in the business, I don't think you have much say mm -hmm. at a young age. Saying, okay, this is not how things should be done. So okay. that could be a pro, could be a con, based on how you <laughs> kind of look at it. Okay, but what are the learnings that you took from the family business that you now apply to Kai? So I think uh, one that we didn't follow, but starting your own factory. Yeah, so definitely at the jewelry business, we run a manufacturing unit. We used mm -hmm. to do retail. Uh, you know, started off with a factory. There was a learning that we don't intend to start a factory at Kai, huh. uh, and I don't see that. As my core job okay. of running a factory, I feel uh, you know there could be someone else better at doing that. Okay. Two, I think uh, learnings would be mainly uh, money management, time mm. management, mm. Um, to respect and value an existing customer. In a longer scale, in the jewelry business, we've had customers for a while. We've seen them go. You understand that uh, you know everything has it's a circle, right? Mm. 
time will flow good times will come bad times will come it needs to move in rotation so you learn to kind of accept that okay if things are not going that's fine today it's fine things will turn around it's a cycle so yeah how and when you guys started kai why don't you guys take us through the journey yeah i think okay. uh, it was we were newly married and we were keen to start something of our own main agenda was pretty silly now if we look at it uh, no why it's not silly she think- joined the family business as well yeah. we had a limited uh, income and we were young keen wanted to travel like we a holiday very- fun is something that we wanted to create where we can it's our own money and we don't have to answer to anybody right um you know if you want five holidays yeah. a year how do you take it <laughs> was the question at that point of time what do you guys take now No, <laughs> I don't think Kai permits that yet. Your But yeah, the first year of Kai, the intention of starting it came from there. Yeah, uh, I think it's d- difficult for us to say, okay, let's take a holiday. You know, there's so much happening. Like, where's the time? Right. But um, yeah, and I mean, that's that was our intention and passion, of course, drove everything to start Kai. But so um, that was the point of starting a business correct. that we wanted to start something. Why footwear? Because for us, we both love shoes. Uh, we thought and we saw a large gap in the market particularly there was no indian brand mm-hmm. doing westernized shoes so if you go back and see 10 years ago the shoe you would buy whether it was there was barely any online at that point but it was always for the masses mm-hmm. you could go abroad and shop from an asos from a prima from a top shop from a new look where you could buy <laughs> shoes at the same price point as the indian brands mm-hmm. but they were much more westernized right. so with the popularity of social media Hmm. and people getting exposed to what is actually happening in the west we saw a massive change happening in india so if i wanted to buy a radna pair of shoes and i had 5000 rupees on a holiday i could buy a three pairs of shoes in bombay i can't go and buy a three pairs of shoes because there's no place that will sell me amazing shoes at 1500 rupees mm-hmm. which are modern so i think that's a clear gap that we saw and we said if we feel that uh, when we were kind of privileged to buy something slightly more expensive also if needed yeah that there will be a large gap for this so mm-hmm. the intention was very clear we make a modern shoe which is fashionable and comfortable mm-hmm. and affordable so those are the ideal three pillow pillows that we saw a gap with and we kind of took that on and said let's see how this goes so rather how were the initial years for this uh so when we thought of what we wanted to start with kai with what it has now become is obviously been a massive change We initially started with a no inventory model, where in 2015 we started um, selling uh, our shoes to a local um, fashion brand, mm-hmm. an online fashion brand. Uh, we were one of the highest sellers at, on their platform. A marketplace. Marketplace in a way. Um, so we started there. So no inventory. We don't hold any inventory. We make the stock for them, and we keep one pair for me. Mm-hmm. And we start. Uh, simultaneously, we started our social media. Hmm. You know the whole entire presence, and being one of the uh, top brands on that platform, we kind of gained some presence on social media noise. People heard of Kai. Hmm. Then one day uh, in 2018, we decided why not just do an exhibition and let's see the response that we get. We did our first exhibition where we were completely sold out, yeah. and a lot of people had heard about Kai. They obviously spoke about the platform. um so we said okay we have something going on going out here for us so why not start our own website which we were shying away from for a while okay started a website in 2018 i was just pregnant at that time i was going to deliver any time at that time but um i think that's where the entire business and kai actually started because we got to do styles that we wanted to do we wanted to sh- cater i mean show people out there and cater to uh our design sense mm-hmm. so that's something that we started off and i think that's where it kicked off from and ever since then we've just been growing you know mm-hmm. on and on every year with different collaborations different collections and i think we've seen a change from what we were capable of in designing and production to what we've done now This all sounds very easy, but ऐसा रहा नहीं होगा. So what no. were the initial challenges and the struggles? जो या फिर initially थे और अभी कुछ change हुए हैं तो किस type के struggles हैं या challenges हैं? So I think uh, like what Aradna said is true, but for me I think the main change happened at our first exhibition. Hmm. So there was the little flea that used to happen back in I think 2018, and we decided let's make a little bit of stock and take a show. We were surprised yeah. that anyone would know Kai. and we were shocked to see that we got at least 100 people who knew about the brand 
hmm. and who were very keen to see what we did. Right. So prior to that, what we did was she said we used to supply to a marketplace. Right. So when we were supplying to a marketplace, mainly designing also had to be basis their requirement. Yeah. What would they buy, okay. etc. So when we built this, we realized that okay, there's a large audience who wants trendier, funkier, newer stuff. So when we build that out, I think we were clear that okay, we've got something right. There are enough people coming and looking for it. Mm-hmm. And when you say challenges, I think uh, so. Our first office was. A part of the loft of my dad's office, the main <laughs> part my sister was using. She had a startup before us, right. so she had occupied eighty percent of the loft. Mm. Our office ceiling height was four and a half feet. Mm. <laughs> Our warehouse was the staircase to the loft. So I think that time it seemed like challenges. Today it seems like fun yeah. when you go back and look at it. Right. But uh, I think that time it was office space, then it was team because it was yeah, just was the no two of us and one intern at that time. Mm-hmm. uh then became one more employee so i, I think, think our challenge quality uh, production was also a large issue because we were absolutely new in the space mm-hmm. uh, we don't we come were, from that background we don't come from a shoe making background we had to bank on someone else to make us the shoes right so that process of actually getting a shoe made and typically every manufacturer in india at a small scale because our volume was really small would actually work with us Was working for a smaller local brand, so they yeah. did not never understood the handwriting or the aesthetic we were trying to explain. So I remember clearly the first few designs we had Kaligar saying, "Mia Bibi, pagal ho gaye, kuch bhi bana rahe, kahan khari dega hai?" And that was our first design that actually yeah. got sold out. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's it's a process, right? Every month or every week, you ask me, I'll have different set of challenges that we're right. facing. But uh, I think till we overcome them in the right amount of time. Yeah, and that's the way a better way to look at it. But how did you guys learn into it? But passion tha, but like. Uh, थोड़े फटके पड़े, थोड़े problems हुए, फिर बराबर से. I think you है? learn a lot from your mistakes. Yeah. Uh, you read up a lot. You speak to people who are mm-hmm. in the industry, not maybe in the industry, but in the same field, uh, similar fields, um, e-commerce especially. So, like I said, it's it's learning on the job. Mm-hmm. No one has taught us anything. Nor have I opened a textbook to check anything. <laughs> It's pretty much trial and error, hmm. and of course, a lot of things are making your mistakes in the past. And how do you make sure you don't repeat those mistakes? Mm-hmm. Uh, talking to a few people, watching things out there. It's a mix of everything that pr- pretty much. I mean, it's we're still facing challenges today, so it's not like we perfected everything. So the right? initial days, I remember, at least four days a week or five days a week, we would be in the factory. Okay. And the reason was that's the only way we realized whether what he's saying is he putting it inside. Hmm. Is there a better solution? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then eventually, there was a phase in Kai when we kind of grew quite a bit and we onboarded multiple new factories. Yeah. And we realized we faced a quality issue to an extent. Right. Where we had a few customers complain where the pairs were wearing out faster. Now we realized that a that wasn't our intention. Hmm. That wasn't what we selected. So why would this happen? Hmm. So when we dug back and realized that okay, me asking them to buy X from a particular shop, is the factory actually buying it? Mm-hmm. And to kind of get that whole process down, we went and opened our own factory. Okay. So we ran our own factory where we had to source every raw material, check the authenticity, check the life, where to buy it from. Mm-hmm. We had the shoe made in front of us. We eventually shut the factory down. Okay. Like we mentioned, not our core, mm-hmm. but the entire process of shoe making. Mm. Uh, why will a shoe last you? Why will a shoe wear out faster? What are the problems that one could come in? For that learning, I think we also had to dirty yeah. our hands entirely, mm-hmm. and that's the only way I think we haven't fully accomplished it or solved for it. But I think we have come a long way from where we were. Okay, so I think we're trying to understand our product much better now than what it was when we initially started. Okay. Initially, when we started, we wanted the designs out there, the whole mm. marketing, social media. That was more of our focus. Yeah. um but i think now it's more product at least he sees that part of it, the entire product getting into the details nitty gritties why won't this work why shouldn't why should we tweak the design right so that there is more comfort stability so i think that's where our focus is now shifted so how do you guys now enable quality check because now you guys have gone back to the source like so what we do currently is slightly different from our most of the current brands work we run a large sampling unit in our office hmm. so we have a small team of workers 
we buy raw materials we create the sample in our office okay uh, we test it we have an experienced qc team now on board since we've gained some scale okay we have a production head who has experienced the 30 years of working in a factory so today when we actually build a sample we test it in office once that sample is tested we then have a detailed spec sheet with every single raw material where is it to be bought from at what price form where and then that is handed over to a factory okay so the point of starting a factory was to make that first shoe mm -hmm. then it's pretty much on auto play so we still build that first shoe mm -hmm. but we don't do the mass production okay got it and then we have basically a team that does an inline qc while it's in process okay oh then a size set kind of comes in a pair in each size which is then tested uh, luckily we have a store uh, close to our office Hmm. So whenever needed or whenever in doubt, we send to the store. We actually get customers trying on the shoe, giving us feedback. I like it, but this could be slightly softer. I would prefer slightly more heel yeah. in this. Hmm. And we try and incorporate that feedback, and then finally it goes into production. Okay. And we actually check out every size set that come. We hmm. have me and my girls in the team hmm. trying out every pair, walking. We take a day to walk around and you know use the pair so that we know if there's any issue. it will come up out then you stop your production at that point right but so we do take all these small small measures in our mm -hmm. own way that we've come up with to yeah. make sure that the shoe is um the stability is good okay so you don't come from the business background so Not at all. how did your family react to it uh my dad was actually very proud he never thought i would be able to do something like this uh so did my mom because i was because i was such an introvert they never thought i'll be able to open my own company and do my own you know so run an entire show um they were very supportive hmm. they were very open to the idea of course because we both were doing it together um i think i've got that support from day one that's not been a problem and now they're extremely obviously proud of okay. course they keep telling me we never thought you'd be able to do something like this but Uh, and you had yeah. a similar kind of support <laughs> or they were hard picks yeah actually uh, <laughs> i kind of give kudos to my grandfather who's no more and my dad because we've been jewelers for five generation yeah um uh, i came out randomly one day and said i want to start a footwear business he said it's a hobby let him do it uh, <laughs> till he's doing jewelry the way it doesn't matter so the first two years was mainly doing jewelry and hmm. a really limited uh, limited amount of time what i would end up giving kai Hmm. and then with this first exhibition at flea we realized that if we actually give it you know a full 10 hours a day this could go places yeah and that's when i went back and had a chat saying i plan to you plan to open a separate office move out from the loft because while it was one office it was still possible to do jewelry kai you know kind of shuffle the day out and uh, i think they were extremely supportive saying go take the plunge if that's your passion and you believe that's your calling do it okay right. Oh, which I don't know. It's not going to be that easy for me to tell my son if he ever asks me, <laughs> saying to leave a full-fledged business which is going yeah. on a few generations, saying that okay. And I ran that for a good ten years hmm. uh, before Kai started. So there was a good seven to eight years where I was, uh, you know, fully fledged uh, taking decisions in the jewelry company. And as this picked up, I felt in the long run this had much more scope, hmm. and this gave me more happiness. I feel in multiple different. Ways. Right. I think the first thing both the families have said, if it's shoes, make sure there's no leather yeah. because I come from a Jain family and he's a vegetarian, a so, family, so. <laughs> like, don't worry, that's covered. Yeah, there was one country, yeah. no business with leather. Leather, oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's pretty much sorted. Yes. Yeah. And how's working with your partner? How do you guys divide your roles? And when does the boundary comes in? I don't, think there's any boundary. Boundary. <laughs> I don't think there's any boundary. Work comes home every day. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but it's a startup. Eventually yeah. uh, we believe it'll get better with time. But as I said, it's good to think. It's somewhere that it is our first passion also, right? So even if it comes home it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I think my parents keep telling us is that guys remember you all have chosen this life. Yeah. Um, we didn't have to do kai. We don't have to put in the hours we do. Oh. Um, we did have a set family business to kind of work in momentum in regular hours without the stress so we were very clear this is a decision we made by our choice right and i think when that is clear everything else kind of takes a back seat right? hmm. there are no boundaries <clears throat> there is no hours 
but it's okay pretty much we somehow figure a way to balance it out but i think since from inception obviously we were both involved in everything we also didn't know what we both um uh, were good at hmm. or our you know strength point uh, strengths were so i think now we kind of in a way know what he is good at and what i am good at and what he handles certain departments and i handle certain departments so we've come to that but of course there is that common point where we both get involved completely yeah. um i think i'm the strict one who says at the end of the day no more <laughs> work talk <laughs> we need to talk about you know other things personal things our kid our kid you know all of that so yeah right. um Well, well, it's a, every day is a new day. And but perks or challenges? What are they? Perks, pata nahi. <laughs> challenges, both are. Perks, okay, I'll say that. Perks, um, I think I learn a lot from him. Hmm. He's helped me grow a lot in the company as a person. Um, he's way more confident. It's not showing right now, but he's way <laughs> more confident than I am. Um. there's nothing like a challenge for him he's he knows how to get his way the right way and get the work done mm. and i think i'm slowly learning that from him um i i wasn't as confident as i was that i am now but he's pushed me a, lo- a lot to do um to grow yeah. in all aspects so i think that's where the perks are we learn from each other we balance each other out and i think my team will definitely tell you that <laughs> um because he is the hyper one and i am the more calm one so all, that all really the helps. patience the little bit of patience that i have is because of aradna yeah um, and we have a team in place today because of aradna okay so if we both are the same person that i don't think I that think dynamic will work in your office as we well pretty so. split personality in yeah. that sense okay. so which works well for us yeah, yeah. so in perks it's basically you know, it's very easy to balance it off So I come out extremely strong on a certain area, hmm. and she's extremely mild in that space, and it goes vice versa. Mm-hmm. But I think challenges is is mainly making sure that we don't uh, lose our personal life yeah. uh, when this whole you know cycle of work that's going on. I think somewhere there, our son has a large role to play. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's it gets easier, right? Today, uh, she has a day. One of us can easily take. some time off to be with him and the other can fill in into someone else's shoes yeah if i had another co-founder who was not my partner and my partner was working in another startup i don't know how that could have been managed correct yeah. when we talk about making a footwear what is the process like like from ideation to you know r&d to you know manufacturing and you know till sales what what is the process like i think firstly you need to have a kit what i mean by kit is you need to have a sole you need to have a last or they call it a firma which is the shape of a shoe which actually the fitting is done on if your sole and your firma so your entire kit is is made perfectly and is tested mm-hmm. that is the first part to be done once your kit is done i think then the design process comes in of what is the vision what's the target audience what are we making for price mm-hmm. point etc mm-hmm. once we kind of close on that uh there are multiple thousands of sketches that we kind of see and then we kind of try and do a mixed collection that speaks our personality as a brand out today at kai kai caters to a college girl kai caters to a mother kai caters to a, a employees of a large company kai caters to the ceo of the company so we've seen this across the board there are people who own gucci but also buy kai okay there are people who are buying kai because it's cheap so yeah as founders we somewhere hold to our brand identity and try and hit as large an audience as we can so basis that as we select and choose designs uh, that kind of the sketch work happens the cad is made once that's approved it goes into the sample team where an actual upo is made and then we kind of test that on multiple shapes sizes right etc and if the last as the forma is fine uh, then it should fit you So how did you guys research on the material you wanted to work on like so to be very honest there was limited research done on the material mm-hmm. and the main we've done that now but in the initial years barely anything and the reason being uh, we were trying to build a business where we give you the latest designs as fast as possible with limited scale the volume of material that we had to buy 
is also limited. So could we actually go and manufacture material? No. Could we source a larger quantity, a smaller quantity of material that we wanted? No. So we had to buy material that is available in the market that a shoemaker has made shoes on and can vouch for it. Yeah. Since we were yeah. new, we had to also bank on someone to say that, okay, if you make it, you won't fall down. Or it's a problem. So it started off from there. And as we've grown now, we've picked out our key main colors and we've worked with manufacturers who manufacture that material in bulk for us, which gives me benefits like the strength, hmm. the abrasion, uh, the timing, the thickness, availability of the right material, the finish. So wow. today, keeping all of that in mind, but I can only do that for your key main colors. There are still multiple odd colors that we have to go back to the market and kind of pick what's available. Because market is such, designs copy is very easy. And if uh, you go to the street shopping market, one case is that you can get the original Kai copies. Mil sakti hai. Correct. But the other thing is that you can give them to factories. They can make similar kind of design and quality for other but brands. That's like happening. They are yeah. your competitors. Correct. How do you guys take so in control for that? There's nothing really you can do about that. I mean... Um, As form of street vendors selling shoes, I think that's beyond our control. Yeah, it's we, beyond our control. We used to get upset initially. Hmm. Now we feel happy. <laughs> uh, we recently caught someone doing an exhibition saying uh, an entire... They put up a stall of Kai shoes. Really? And they put Kai got Kai written on it. We filed a police complaint. There were two girls who apologized. We mm. took action at our level. But eventually, as I said, there's nothing much I can stop if someone goes tomorrow to a shop in Bandra and starts selling similar shoes and writes Kai on them. Me filing a case against them also is going to be wasting my time and money. Yeah. But I think when we talk about vendors, we also so, now know yeah, the kind of factories you want to work with. The... Mm. Rapo that we have with those factories and vendors. We've had that in the past. We've seen it. Hmm. And I think that just helps you eliminate who you want to work with, who you can work with, where you can try and stop it. Right. Um, you know, you may sign NDAs and all of that, but these are at the end of the day factories. So. But the simpler way is that since there is an inline process happening and the, there is someone from a company visiting that factory almost every alternate day. Yeah. So in some or the other way, there is a check happening a check, to see yeah. what's happening. But is there a, a foolproof way of eliminating it? No. The day we move to extremely large factories, uh, I think the NDA would have more value. Today, most of our factories, we have an NDA okay. and which, which, which holds a, a lot of value where they would not dare go do something like this. But there are a few smaller setups. We started working with them uh, in the initial days of Kai. Yeah. And we decided that we will continue working with them because they have a large role to play in where Kai is today. So right. When no one was ready to make shoes for us because our MOQs were really small. And when I mean really small, it was 30 pairs per color. So when I wanted to make a complicated design for 30 pairs, yeah. uh, there was no factory willing to do it. There was one guy who stood aside and said, I'll make it. Yeah. And I said, you have faith, you do this and we will grow. Mm. So I think, yeah, he's the guy with again a smaller vendor, but we still continue working with him. Got it. And how much is the Indian footwear market and how much of it is organized? And do you guys bifurcate it in the footwear market anyway? What do you mean by organized? Like branded. So there is, I think, majority of the market is an unorganized market because the masses of India do shop at a particular price point, hmm. which is an unorganized uh, sector. But I think we as Kai aren't catering to that at a large level. Hmm. There is a large organized sector that is growing by the day. But like I said, with the increase of social media and the increase of awareness in all our lives on a daily basis, it becomes a lot easier that people are buying from Kai, I don't think only for the design. They are buying from us because they somewhere believe in what we stand for. They believe in what we're trying to create. They understand what design we're trying to make. Mm -hmm. So there is a connect beyond that single design or a single pair of shoe. And I think that's eventually how a brand can be built. So our focus is we don't want someone to buy it because ye juta pasand hai le re, nahi. that ends, right? Tomorrow someone else picks a better shoe, they'll move there. Hmm. So I think uh, community is the right answer. Yeah. That when we build on is when all of this kind of falls into place. So Aradha, what are the consumer trends you are seeing in the footwear industry? It's 
so it changes every quarter every year um for example our transparent materials that we we are playing on that's been going on for i think the last two years now we've been playing with transparent mm-hmm. so when we know something works really well for us we try and adapt it in different ways mm. or different styles so that's something that's been running right now um for us right now that's working cuz we see season wise embellishments zaris okay. um what we call our sliders that's really working really well that's really trending right now different types of sliders so earlier used to be what do you call the typical birkenstocks mm-hmm. so that kind of silhouette okay. but um kind of gi- making it more fashion giving a more fashion statement to it so adding a lot of embellishments or zari um buckles you know making it look a little more fancy or uh, giving that and and i think after covid comfort has been the top priority yeah. for most people Definitely. so that's pretty much i feel one of the trends that we're working on that we try and find comfort in everything we kind of incorporate in all of our designs mm-hmm. whether it's the silhouette or it's the material or the extra cushion that we give i feel that is right now trending okay. uh, because whenever you ask any customer like humko we just need something that's really comfortable yeah so that is something that we are catering to correct correct even now we are also finding either shoes yeah heels or everything should be comfortable no it's, more in I think space. still yeah, those have gone clothes. out I think um you know I was just talking to a consumer a, a customer the other day and she was like uh, you guys have somehow got your heels really comfortable because we don't try and do very do pencil heels tall heels because we know that's not going to happen yeah. in India you're not going to get that happen. stability no and that stiletto that can be comfortable that exactly no it. stiletto is comfortable so i'm not going to lie to you and say i'm giving the most comfortable stiletto but i can give you a heel which has a broad base to give you that comfort and stability so i feel you know we're trying to work around whether it's the heel or material or the silhouette we're trying to give you comfort in some way or the other yeah, if i see anybody wearing such i'm like mujhe abhi back dard hone lag yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've taken a conscious effort that we won't do stilettos and there are multiple designs that will look amazing if you have a, s- a thin pencil heel. Yeah. There was a movie I think Cinderella the remake of Cinderella and usme wo genie aake kehta hai ki footwear mai kuch bhi kar sakta hu par footwear comfortable nahi. Okay. So what are the marketing objectives for Kai and what are the channels that are being effective for you guys? so marketing objectives for us is like i said it's again it's the single word to answer would be community hmm. if we build a community around what we believe in uh, i think that's the best and the ultimate goal from all different avenues or channels or aspects hmm. that we look at it in terms of avenue we use social media as a large play we would call ourselves a social media brand back in the day because before our website our sales would be through instagram and facebook and i think um uh, that's those two platforms are ideally where uh, we built our presence right so today if someone follows sky they kind of and they've seen that happening for the last 5 years they believe in the handwriting that we provide hmm. and which is visible so today there are many of our customers who can spot a shoe and say this just looks like a kai even though they don't see the brand name on it so that eventually is the objective of our marketing campaign that can you spot a shoe and hmm. say whether it's from our brand or no without seeing the brand name But how yeah, do you so achieve that? You are talking about we'll making that. a community, but so how so are you building a community? Achieve that through kind of it. connecting with them in the right yeah. way. So, like I said, we use social media. We would convey and communicate what we believe in, how we made the product, hmm. what are we trying to sell. If that ideally somewhere connects with you, your beliefs and my beliefs match at a common level, then it it becomes much easier for you to kind of be a part of the community, and you would want to see the content we put up. Hmm. So, if I can engage you in the right way. and engaging today is a you know very encouraged word but it's it's very difficult because there are yeah. too many distractions an yeah. average person sees over 500 ads a day so oh, so how many ads can you remember why would you consume that ad there are so many pages brands are trying to be creators creators are trying to be brand there's so many things how do you break the clutter and you know engage with the community it, it's the you community. have to do what you do best um don't try and compete with other people because you will go crazy doing that um obviously be aware of what is happening how trends are changing you can't be doing the same kind of marketing that we were doing in 2018 mm-hmm. you have to move with time you have to move with trends that is something that we're 
like i think half our day goes into just talking about how we're going to create more content new content engaging content uh, we have our own small team that in our in house that creates it as well as our agency hmm. so um so simply put if if i wanted you to kind of consume what we're putting out so what would you see if you're scrolling through 50 reels a day hmm. what reel did your hand stop at so yeah. that's basically I Our definitely marketing. don't want ads. I don't no, want so, salesy things. Correct, but if a, so, that's exactly what I said. That that's how we build a community. So my communication needs to be based on what would you like to hear. If I can actually connect with you, beyond saying, "Oh, this is cheap, yeah. buy it. This is newly launched, buy it." How else can I engage with you? Hmm. And that's pretty much our definition of marketing. And we also study the consumer's behavior. We know what they're looking for, so that one ad. should be able to give you all that information possible for that customer to click it and not have to swipe and scroll through other you know okay let me go see what's next hmm that should be that should give you that enough information for you to click it so that's the kind of content we need to create we are creating or we want to also continue creating that hmm i've read your mind i know what you want <laughs> click it you know i'm giving you that information <laughs> what factors according to you guys should one brand take while considering while sticking to a d2c brand or you know transitioning into an omni channel brand i think it's uh, it's your vision right somewhere everyone has a goal and a vision and it's your best or fastest way or the most efficient way to kind of reach them so in our case we realized that uh, being footwear and footwear today sizes are mentioned only in terms of length of the shoe so when okay. you say size 37 38 39 that defines the length no one talks about the width so yeah. you could have a broad foot someone else could have a narrow foot how does one decide whether it's going to fit you so even though e-commerce is coming in a large way i think a lot of people are still hesitant to buy footwear online so the simplest and the best way for that we saw that change happening where people would want to come and visit our office thing hey, if you don't mind can i please come to your office <laughs> can i please try that one shoe can i come to your warehouse so we used to have people showing up at our warehouse every single day and they so, were okay to shop there and you know yeah, so there's but, packing happening yeah. it's it's messy it's chaotic hmm. and they were fine they would come there try the shoe try and the buy shoe. so that kind of gave us an answer that we are catering to an x amount of audience but there's a large perspective which is still large plate which is still not comfortable shopping online hmm. especially a slightly older sector so for them we realized that i think let's try out a store if that works okay. uh, it will become much easier for a consumer to actually believe in what they see and buy that trust and loyalty that you get hmm. after you know okay they have a store it's a legit brand right i've tried it i've touched it i felt it i know it's hmm. of yeah. good quality you know that all plays on the mind we've gone through the initial we've phase where customers that, said yeah. that if i do a prepaid order and what if you don't deliver what will yeah. happen yeah yeah i said ma'am we're running a business why would we <laughs> run away with your one order's money but that yeah. to overcome that at an initial stage is also a task what are your distribution chan- uh, channels basically so we are currently um, we have four stores in india yeah in delhi ahmedabad uh, phoenix lower prel and thane yeah we are also present in ponias pop up we are present in rapport in the south in hyderabad guntur and vijayawada we have something in calicut in a mall opening up soon okay so uh, there are a few mbos uh, there are marketplaces hmm. uh, but the main channels would be our website and our four stores where you get to see the entire collection and what would be the percentage of sales on these like your own website your uh, marketplaces so we are at about 65% of sales are through our website hmm. about 20% is through retail and the balance is for marketplaces marketplace and mbo yeah two stores have just opened yeah yeah uh, two are about a year and a half old in fact hmm. phoenix completes two years tomorrow okay so this percentage will also keep changing with time the opening a offline store is a lot tougher than you know managing an online business what are your thoughts about uh, i think uh, both have their set of challenges i wouldn't call one tougher i don't think online running an online business is easy it may be easier to it's definitely much easier to start an online business right but to succeed at one i think both get equally challenging and both have the different set of challenges so 
for us the main aspect is how do we draw a common line between retail and online yeah uh, merchandise changes my customer at phoenix expects something very different from a customer online hmm so i think yeah. to bridge that gap in the middle keeping supply chain and operations intact is the current goal because your merchandise yeah when like he said online right now because that being mainly our focus mm-hmm. a 65 70% of our sales come through that uh when we order we are we always first think online first when we place an order we forget that okay you know this much will go to the stores how will it perform in the stores so i think we need some more years for that data to build right for stores to understand you know the But even the success of stores true. actually vary on a lot many years you can't you like, can't say oh, in see, one year there's also stores. in a store today there's a salesman in a store who kind of communicates so he is my content bank for my website <laughs> on my website there's an image there's a video that speaks to yeah. you about why to buy uh, can i actually get the sales person in my store to speak the same language yeah as that video on my website because if i can explain the comfort better through a video then my online would do better hmm. so i think uh, merchandise uh, communication again right can we actually communicate because it's very easy for me to communicate can my sales team across the country communicate in the same passion the same language that we would show if that comes out then i think you know it becomes a lot easier Exactly how do you inculcate that in various touch points like across your team across your warehouses across you know uh, your you know your sales person So we basically it's obviously there's there's you know manuals created there's training done but we try and get them to office as more as possible so let's say the retail staff at Phoenix they never have a day off retail anyways is a hectic journey they're working long hours but we try and make sure that every week at least two of them spend 3 hours in the office So by doing that, what happens is they see the hustle in the office. They see the passion. They see the communication before the design is passed. Hmm. Uh, their belief in the product, their belief in the brand, drastically changes. I think that is also a very, very important role to keep the team motivated. Hmm. Uh, we may have, you know, high flying visions for the company, but for us to gain success, the entire team from zero to hundred, everybody needs to believe in that. and to kind of run that through the system is our main job as founders all right and what are your thoughts on the ongoing debate of d2c versus omni channel as i said i i don't think it's d2c versus omni channel i think each and every brand will find a common path that works and in the recent years a lot of the d2c brands uh, who have done pretty well have entered into an omni channel model yeah and i think that is the future right eventually yeah. for any business uh, to sustain it there was zara world. that only sold offline back in the day there was no online if online opened they can't say i'm a retail brand i won't go online yeah oh, you're going to be present at every avenue where a customer wants to buy if there's quick commerce for fashion tomorrow which is already pretty much there hmm. oh, i think that's going to be the it's going to be d2c versus omni channel or quick commerce eventually in the next year are you guys planning to go on quick commerce I don't think with footwear maybe if we get specialized shoes or functional shoes for a particular reason like to launch a rainy wear shoe or a gumboot I would yeah. happily do it on quick commerce hmm. but to sell you a fashion pair of shoes I don't think quick commerce would be the right approach because it's a large variety of SKUs and options yeah so it doesn't support that model I and uh, what is the split between your brand and performance marketing and different stages what has it been I think it is to initially okay. be ninety five percent or ninety nine percent performance, and branding would be everything that we could do without spending money. Oh. But with time, uh, it's a conscious effort that we get to fifty fifty or sixty forty. But I still think we are at about seventy seventy five percent performance marketing, hmm. and the rest being branding. Okay. And this is also uh, this is also a journey. This is currently in the phase we are at with the targets and the hmm. goals we have for the current year. This is the mix we believe works for us, and I hope next year we have a larger mix towards branding and less towards performance. Got it. And how is influencer marketing in like fixes in your uh, your you know marketing? So, I think it's changed over the years. We were very big on influencer marketing okay. from the beginning. Hmm. Um, 
but now i think we're working a lot with a lot of micro influencers uh, getting a lot of change of content in the way that it's perceived you uh, reaching different audiences hmm. uh, we are still working with a lot of your big influencers but to what extent will it actually work to what extent will it actually convert the into sales objective or perspective from an influencer will have to change yeah earlier why did you, why did one go to an influencer today why does one go hmm. oh, the different answers oh, i think if you want awareness oh, influencers are amazing right if you're looking for sales oh, it comes with scale right today yeah. if i get a 1% jump in my orders because of an influencer it is not helping me grow oh, the same thing because there's a limit to what one would post and how many would buy oh, the same thing 4 years ago would make a 20% impact on my sales hmm so as with scale uh, awareness branding positioning our larger words we would use on why we work with an influencer and your earlier it would be sales okay. you want to increase business let's go to an influencer but right. i think the market was also very different back then with influencers yeah. at that time people were only concentrating on sales and today with and other larger brands sorry the larger brands actually paying influencers the price that they demand yeah. it's not feasible to expect a return on investment if you yeah. say i'm going to give you x amount of money how many orders will i get uh, that math does not make sense which could make sense maybe 2 hmm. years ago hmm i think if your approach is clear and your objective is clear your strategy needs to be planned accordingly but you do guys have an in-house content creator <laughs> yes we definitely do it has do. helped definitely <laughs> oh yes a long large way uh, so masoom has been a part of the journey since the start hmm. and uh, she has played a major role in creating the awareness that guy has today hmm. but with that said as i said today we believe awareness is not the problem for kai if i want to be in the top of your mind i cannot keep going out and creating awareness again and again you are aware of kai i need to figure another more sustainable manner hmm. to get you to be in top of your mind so what are the kind of audiences you are targeting through influencers the micro influencers you it varies about. again very drastic so we we have less of a presence in the south Okay. So we are trying to work with a lot new people there across the category to see what set of an audience responds better. Because I feel today, with the newer generation coming in or the Gen Z, uh, they do listen to influencers, but in a very selective manner. Uh, pricing also has a very large play on whether an influencer brings you results or not. Okay. So hypothetically, let's say we would use an influencer in a particular region to gain. for the south to gain awareness in that campaign uh, i want to hit uh, mothers with a new range we've launched for rainy wear which we believe they are looking for comfort good mm-hmm. grip they're going to be running around their kids it's an ideal shoe for them so we would target particular influencers who would have a larger connect with mothers so again based on the shoe based on the campaign based on the objective yeah. we would kind of diversify and pick who we take So you guys have tried DVC, TVC, or it's for anything, or it's Sorry. just TVC. We have not TVCs tried. TVCs we've no. never tried. Never. Yeah. We've uh, done a few hoardings. Uh, we do small installations around malls in the cities. Mm. We do multiple pop-ups. Uh, earlier used to be a lot of them. We used to do at least two a month across the country, and that way we would have people from different cities who want to try Kai before buying it to actually try up, and if they're happy, mm. then they would go back and shop online. Okay. So our model was to do exhibitions so that the first touch, human touch, actually is there. Hmm. And once they are happy, they've met the founders, they've heard the story, they've seen the brand. There's a lot more comfort and trust that builds in. Okay. So each to each one of you, your advice, <coughs> you know, for for founders looking to build their marketing teams, their marketing teams, or just a team, a marketing team. <laughs> um, I think. one is that of course the person has to be very aligned with what you want what your company needs um they should share that same passion and i'm saying that after many years of you know uh being having a team grow that 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 particular team or that particular person needs to share that same passion speak the same language as you because if they don't and they don't see the same vision they're not going to you're not going to get that output and result that you really want mm-hmm. um creative of course i mean that comes with the but i think it's just about sharing the same 
vision and passion and speaking the same language according to me so for me i think definitely passion oh uh, yes and passion for smartness is what i would pick because i believe someone can get smarter it's difficult to build passion right um but beyond that i think for a marketing team uh, understanding of the product market fit of a product is the number one thing for me yeah if you can understand why does one need your product why does one buy your product why is one ready to spend x amount of money on your product and you can justify that and have a solid reasoning to yourself and your team i think everything else falls into place you and we tell our teams you know please believe in your product and then only you will be able yeah. to yeah. sell whatever you are selling so first you need spend some time believing in the product and then only go out yeah yeah no, no definitely sure. okay and if you guys have to go back to the younger self and tell what learnings you have today and you wish you could tell to the younger self what would be i think uh, tell my younger self or tell someone else sorry your younger self i think i would go back and uh, very few regrets but i would build a stronger senior team from day 1 and give a lot more importance to process and systems i think we share that same vision <laughs> i think process and system from day 1 Okay, and what is the secret sauce of hiring the right talent? Let us know when you. <laughs> no, um, I wish. Uh, as in, glad to know if anyone has one. But for us, again, when we are hiring, uh, we've tried multiple exercises. We've tried, you know, putting down, putting a personality of the human or the job required. So let's say if I need a marketing person, what are the key personality traits I would look for? How do I evaluate? those personality traits mm -hmm. uh, and kind of market but eventually i think the common answer comes down to is how passionate are you uh, how willing are you to learn to change how willing are you and how hungry are you to grow if you are if that kind of fits in <laughs> and what are going to you it's source mm. um i mean i love our team that we have currently i think we have a really good mix of people mm -hmm. uh I think it would be passion. Some you find passion in some people. Some people are really hardworking. Some people are who are just very out there in their thoughts, and some people are just like introverts in terms of thinking. And just their output says it all. Hmm. So it's it's all these people is some you need one of each one of them in your team. I hmm. feel okay to get a good mix, right? And uh, especially for you, Aradna. things you had to learn to become an entrepreneur finance <laughs> <laughs> i think that's still an ongoing thing accounts finance is something that um was never my strong point mm -hmm. uh which i tried to escape all these years even after my dad being a banker <laughs> but i think now that i have my own business i have to know right the difficult paths the easy paths the paths i'm trying to run away and he makes sure i'm sitting in every finance meeting so i understand what's happening um but yeah i think it would just be that and for you yeah or it was running in the blood so no no it's not that i think what's difficult was uh, sorry i think it's also taking risks yeah yeah for me it's <laughs> taking risks think, yeah taking risks is a large play yeah uh, also to be an entrepreneur i said it's the business i came from was my previous experience was me running a solo ship not a large team uh, in terms of doing things so today delegation processes systems is something that i felt i lacked initially and i'm building towards in myself that i can have pass on that to my team and in my company mm. i think it's a mixture of everything like you said right i need to have the risk we need to have the hustle again a very large play in a startup because things don't work out your way and you can't take everything by the way it looks right so you have to be ready to do it your hands can't happen go there do it yourself and i think that's something which uh, which time and work will only teach you it's easy to kind of sit and say or talk but if you're in that position you can either leave it or you go do it yourself and i think doing it yourself mm -hmm. proves that you can hustle and then eventually your team would also kind of follow Yes, yeah, so I wanted to speak about it. How you build that mindset of mindset of an entrepreneur? You need to build a rock inside. <laughs> I mean, I really don't have an answer to that question. Now. So mindset needs to be stability, right? You're going to have uh, 
extremely high days, extremely weak days to keep your composure, hmm. keep your cool, or keep, keep it balanced. There would be days when your team may have messed up in a large way, but you see that what they require is motivation. Yeah. Um, there are days when I think though the team has messed up, it's because of carelessness. So I think it's the right mixture of you being balanced at all points of time and you having the ability to multitask. Yeah. At currently our stage of a startup, you have to have the ability to multitask. We have to run six divisions, look into all, hmm. and there are fires. Yeah. So there are fires and our job should not be firefighting. Yeah. It okay. should be firefighting for maybe one hour a day. So I think if we kind of balance those things, which comes back to being how stable are you, how level-headed and focused are you, and you stick to your core. You don't tend to forget hmm. why does one actually buy shoes from guy. I think for an entrepreneur, you can't switch off. You can't let yourself switch off. Even if you're taking that holiday, I think if you're taking a holiday, there's something going to be at the back Today of Today we mind. can't switch off, but we eventually will. But that's my mindset at the moment. But that also takes toll on your mental health, yeah. right? You can't switch off. You're not able to take leave when you want to. Or, but like, team ke liye composure, just like he said, you need to be composed so that the team can work. Correct. So how do you guys handle that? We don't get it right all the time. And I'm being very honest. My team may be laughing when they see this. Like he's talking about being composed. But as I said, we're individuals. We have to try. Yeah. If I'm not perfect at it today, it's okay. We should, can we get there in the near future is yeah. the larger point. So how do you guys like deal with it for your mental health? What do you guys do for it? To keep yourself sane so that the business keeps being sane. I think he find, he found his spot that he's... Uh, for me, it's... Going back home to Aryan, and I that's where I feel I switch off hmm. uh, my friends, you know. And I think you can speak about your no, I think, passion of sports, where I think you just switch off for some time. I and definitely you just need downtime. Uh. Yeah. So, where there's nothing happening. So, for yeah. me, that's when I'm playing a sport, uh, I don't tend to think of anything else. So hmm. I try and do that at least twice, thrice a week, which gives me complete two hours of that's uh, amazing. downtime. Yeah. So no, I think that's the... needed. It's needed completely now for both of us. Yeah. For you also. <laughs> I mean, if I have my, you know, you're playing with my son and my phone will be on, or I get a call, he'll just stop talking. He's like, you finish it, switch off your phone and then be with me. So, you know, I love it that he's got that voice now that he's telling me he's been so supportive with both of us, you know, being able to work for so many hours. And, yeah. Um, now it's like when I'm with Aryan, I have to put my phone away and that's how I get Life learnings and advice for entrepreneurs, both of you. So I think, um, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Go, no, 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 go. You go. Okay. Um, so I think I would tell a new entrepreneur, budding entrepreneur, um, you can never get it right. You don't have to know everything. We are not the Einsteins of this company, <laughs> of this world. Um, the best education you can get is learning on the job. Right. Be sure of yourself. Be very confident of what you wanted to start out there and deliver that. There will be many things coming your way which will confuse you, which will be, you know. Just be focused on what you want to do, what your uh, vision is and just follow that. And learn on the way. It's a fun cur learning curve to just learn on the way, make 100 mistakes. Because you will definitely grow further because of that. I think for me, what I would say is um, definitely have fun, right? It's, it's a journey and there would be a time in life when you go back and look back at your initial years. And the only thing you don't want to be saying is, oh, I didn't have a good time. So I think definitely whatever you do, do it with all your gut, all your, all your passion, mm -hmm. all your love you can. And make sure you have fun along the way. Okay. If you're enjoying what you're doing, uh, it doesn't need to feel like work. And if you get there, I think that's what success ideally should mean to you. That you enjoy, mm -hmm. by choice, you want to do your work. So thank you, Aradhna and Anraj, for being here. It was really lovely chatting you and there was so much to learn from. Thank you for being here. Thank, thank you, you for, for having, having us. us and Complete pleasure to be here.